remember in high school that we had to do an awful lot of grammar. And every time the teacher started to teach grammar, she'd pull out these really musty, dusty textbooks, and we spent a whole lot of time doing things like circling nouns, and it was really boring. And let's face it, when things are boring, you tune out. It wasn't until a little bit later in life that I realized how important it was to know the basics of grammar. It gets tested all the time. Whether we're looking at the SAT, or whether we're looking at the ACT or the SOL, these things all require a basic knowledge of grammar. Likewise, when you get out into the work world, whether you want it to be the truth or not, people judge you by the way that you speak and the way that you write. So it's really important to have a basic understanding of the parts of speech and sentence patterns. The other thing that this kind of functional grammar helps you with is if you've ever gotten red ink on your paper and you're not exactly sure why, and sometimes the teacher has put things on your paper like CS or FRAG or AWK and it doesn't make any sense to you. These are all the kind of basic parts of speech and sentence patterns that you need to know in order to avoid making some of those errors that lead to red ink. A CS is a comma splice, a fragment is a little sentence that isn't quite a sentence, and things that are awkward are just grammatically strange for some reason. So this is going to present to you just a basic overview of the major parts of speech and again the main sentence patterns that we see in the English language. In the past, when people would diagram sentences, you would have to put charts on the board. And again, these charts would have uh, basic kinds of parts of speech in them, but you had to put it in, in a very strange sort of fashion. We don't really diagram sentences anymore. What we're concerned with right, is what the piece of the part of speech is doing, right, which is its function, and what it is, can you identify it? And again, you might ask yourself, well, so why do I care? But again, these things are going to help you from making some of those common errors or from making the mistakes that people oftentimes do. And again, these mistakes can lead to lower scores on standardized tests, or they can lead to just simply failing a paper because you failed to pay attention to the rules. So when you do an analysis of form and function, you have to identify what something is. That's the form, right? So I'm going to ask you, for example, in the sentence, John runs, right? John is a noun. That's what it's doing. That's its form. Then you have to identify, so what's the function, right? Well, John is the subject of the sentence. That's, that's what it's doing here. So the reason that this matters is because identifying the form leads to the function, and the function answers a lot of these questions like, am I supposed to use a comma here? Do I use who or whom? Is it he or is it him? Right? All of those kinds of questions can be answered very easily if you keep in mind when we talk about grammar. You're going to have to identify what the part of speech is, that's the form, and then so what is that form doing? And that's the function. So to start with, from the time that you were in kindergarten, you've probably been doing things like identifying nouns. And again, we get told from an early age that nouns are people, places, and things, as well as ideas. And again, then we start learning that there are proper nouns, and those are ones that are capitalized, they're specifics, and then there are common nouns, which are the ones that are non-specific. So we know that basic thing, and if I gave you sentences and asked you to circle the noun, I'm pretty confident that you guys could do that. Right? However, when we get into, so why does that matter? That's where sometimes the lesson gets lost in translation. It matters, of course, that you can pick out nouns. But what matters even more is that you can identify what the function of these nouns in the sentence happens to be. So here's an example, right? Nouns can be a subject. The subject is the person or the thing that is doing the action. So if you take this sentence, 
Katie is my friend, if I asked you to circle the nouns, you'd probably circle Katie and friend. Both of those are nouns, right? But what I'm looking for is who is doing the action, right? In this case, the person that's referred to as the is, is being, is Katie. So Katie is the subject of the sentence. So why does any of this matter before you tune out? Because nouns can do two things in terms of their functions. They can be subjects, meaning that they're doing the actions, or they can be objects, meaning that they receive the action of the verb, right? And those positions, whether it's the subject or the object, is going to answer questions for you, like do I use who, which is always an object pronoun, right, or subject pronoun, or do I use whom, and whom is always an object pronoun. So that's why you write to whom it may concern, right? It's an, an object pronoun there. So knowing whether it's a subject or an object is important, right? So let's look at a couple of examples so you can see the difference and you're able to apply them. And like I said, this is one of those things that's going to matter because later when you're asked to identify whether something's in the subject position or object position, you're going to need to be able to identify the function. So if I have a sentence like this, he kissed me, right? He is the subject. He is the one that's doing the action. What did he do? Well, he kissed. Whom did he kiss? He kissed me, right? Me is the object. And the reason why he kissed me and not he kissed I is that me is an object pronoun, right? So again, when we look at sentence position, right, what we're concerned about is, is that noun in the subject position where it is the main thing that's doing the action? Or is it in the object position where it's again receiving the action of the verb? When we get to pronouns, pronouns again are a part of speech that replace nouns. And again, you're mostly familiar with the personal pronouns like we, she, I, it, me, uh, but there are other types of pronouns like that, right? Get me that. Well, what is the that? Well, that replaces whatever word it is that you mean. So get me that if it's a book, that is a pronoun that replaces the word book. So pronouns, like nouns, can be objects or they can be subjects. There are certain pronouns that can only be one or the other. So I have a quick little chart that I'd like for you guys to fill in. And the chart is important because again, it's gonna help you to identify one of the most common sentence errors. And a really common sentence error is called pronoun antecedent disagreement. And what that means is that the pronoun doesn't match the thing that comes before it, the thing that it is referring to. So we're going to do this little chart so that you can see why pronouns are important. So a subject position pronoun completes the sentence blank ran. So again, I ran, we ran, she ran, right? When we look at an object pronouns, it would complete the sentence, give that to, so give that to me, right? Um, not I, right? All of those are showing you the difference between subject pronouns and object pronouns. So going back to form and function, if you know what position something is playing in a sentence, then you no longer have to play it by ear, listening to it and guessing. And again, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that we speak incorrectly all the time. Do not trust your ear because again, oftentimes the things that we say are not correct. All you have to do is to look at anybody's social media site and you know that people don't know the difference between there and there and they don't know whether to say I or me or who or whom on any of their posts, right? People speak incorrectly all the time. So don't trust your ear. Trust your ability to look at a sentence and what it's doing. And then from there, you can pick the correct pronoun. So on your pronoun chart, 
right? First person subject pronoun is I, right? So I run, right? The object is me, right? So give that to not I, but give it to me. Second person subject pronoun is you. You run, right? Give it to you. You is also the object pronoun. So again, it stays the same. In the third person, right, in this singular, it's he, she, or it. He ran, she ran, it ran, right? In the object position, give it to him. Give it to her, right? Give it to it. That's an object. In the uh, plural of first person, we have we. So we run. Give it to, not we, but give it to us, right? Just like in Spanish, we generally don't use the second person plural. It's you all, or if you're up north, you guys, or if you're down south like us, y'all, right? You all is referring to that second person plural. And again, it stays the same. Like you all run, right? Give it to you all. So again, we don't use that. It's like the Spanish vosotros. We just don't use it very often. So subject pronoun in third is they, so they run. Object would be give it to them. So if you're wondering if something is a subject or an object, again, use its position in the sentence. Blank run, I run. The dog ran not to I, but the dog ran to me, right? You run, right? He runs, right? But the dog ran not to he, the dog ran to him. So knowing whether something is in the subject or the object position is going to help you with some of those sentence completions with pronouns that can be a little bit tricky. So again, if you have who, who is always over there on the subject side. Object pronoun is whom, right? So again, if you have something that is asking you give it to, it's to whom, which is why when you write letters, it's to whom it may concern. It's in the object position there. One of the other reasons that we have to know pronouns, not just because of agreement, right, is also because of the fact that when we use pronouns today, because we're so worried about being offensive to the different genders, we oftentimes cause pronoun antecedent agreement. This is one of the most tested pieces on the SAT. Here's an example, right? A writer must always try to use their best grammar and diction, right? So again, this sentence has a big problem. A writer is one person. So again, a writer must always try to use his best grammar. If you want to be correct, you can say his or her best grammar. But if you use the word there, it's incorrect because a writer is singular. It doesn't match with there. And there are some really tricky pronouns. Neither is zero people. Not this guy, not this guy. So again, it's singular. Either, one or one, it's singular. No body, that's one person. No one is one person. Everyone, someone, anyone, anybody, somebody, they're all singular pronouns, one body. Which is why it sounds weird, but if somebody leaves a handbag in class, most of the time people will say, oh, so-and-so left their purse. You can't say that, right? Someone left their purse. Someone left, hopefully, her purse. Maybe it's a purse, but again, her purse. So listen to these, and again, they're one of the reasons why I tell you, you can't always trust your ear because we speak incorrectly all the time. Everyone, right, one entity, brought his or her book. Every time I do this, people are like, no, everyone brought their book. Everyone is one unit, one entity. So everyone brought his or her book. Someone left, and people go, their computer. No, someone left his or her computer. So again, either, one guy or one guy, it's singular, either James or Ollie left his essay. If you, again, use the wrong pronoun, it's an agreement problem. 
And again, this is a grammatical error that will get you into trouble, whether you're taking the ACTs or the SATs or the SOLs. So it's important to know your pronouns and to know how they're used so we can stave off or avoid some of the really big and tricky errors that we can make with them. Now that we've dealt with nouns and pronouns, it's important to move on to verbs. As we know from kindergarten and elementary school, verbs express actions. They can also be states of being. They can also help you know how long something has been going on. So there's three types of verbs that you need to be aware of for our purposes. The first are action verbs. Action verbs are doing something. So again, even things that you wouldn't necessarily think of as a particular motion, like sleeping, is still a kind of action, right? So again, sitting, even though it's not doing something, is in a way doing something. And so that's an action verb. So again, if you are uh, running, um, that is again an action. So action verbs express some kind of particular motion. Linking verbs act as the verbal equivalent of an equal sign in a sentence, right? So he is stupid. Is, right, is essentially working as an equal sign in that sentence. He equals stupid. So again, it's linking one thing to the next. So when we look at linking verbs, they are essentially, right, states of being is, are, was, were, right? All of those are states of being. And if you look at a sentence and that verb is acting as an equal sign in a sentence, it's a linking verb. There are some linking verbs that can be a little bit tricky, like feel, right? If you are feeling something, right? Like grabbing a hold of it, like you know, feeling on a cantaloupe to see if it is ripe, that's an action verb, you're doing something. But if you're saying like, I feel sick, that's actually a state of being. You're saying I equal sick. So sometimes when you look at those sentences, you have to be really tricky because even verbs like taste, right? If you're doing something actively, like he tastes the soup, that is an action verb. If you say the soup tastes salty, that's linking because you're saying soup equals salty. So linking verbs act as states of being. They're the, the verbal indication of that equal sign in a sentence. The last type of verb is helping verbs. And helping verbs let you know how long something has been going on. Has been or have been. Um, all of those are examples of helping verbs. They let you know how long this action has been taking place. So in this sentence, he has been swimming for three hours. Has been, right, is helping that verb to swim, right, the swimming that's going on. He is in the pool now, right, and he has been there for the past few hours. So again, has been is that helping verb. And sometimes it can be a little bit tricky to know whether something is a linking verb or a helping verb, but just look at the state of being. Here's an example. He is running from the cops. If I said right now, outside the window, there goes so-and-so and he is running from the deputy. Is running lets you know that he's doing that now, currently. So is running, right, is a helping verb versus he is on the run from the cops. He equals on the run. So again, he has broken parole or whatever. He equals on the run. So again, that's the difference between the two. So you need to be able to look at a sentence and identify the verbs and to know a little bit about the verb types. So again, action verbs are doing something. Linking verbs are the verbal equivalent of that equal sign in a sentence. And helping verbs let you know how long something has been going on. So again, I always try to go back to why do you care? Why does this matter? Why do you need to know these particular things? Well, one reason is because in your writing, you need to make sure you don't use too many linking verbs. Too many linking verbs makes an essay really dull. If your teacher asks you to write an essay on somebody who is uh, famous and a role model, if you say, he is nice, 
He is kind. He is sweet. He is my friend. Again, we're asleep before we get to the third sentence. So too many linking verbs using is or are or was or were over and over makes an essay really dull. So you do need to pay attention to how many linking verbs that you use. The other reason is that passive voice, right, using is ing'ing something. So instead of he, he is singing. Why not just say he sings? It's a much stronger verb there. So again, using passive voice is not considered as effective or the paper is written by John. Why not just say John wrote the paper? That's a much stronger piece. So passive voice is considered kind of wussy when you use it. And so the more active your verbs are, the stronger your papers will be. So a good writer checks the number of times that he or she uses those linking verbs and then rewrites the sentences if he or she finds that there are too many linking verbs in that essay. So here are some examples. And again, on the SAT or PSAT or ACT, they'll ask you to rewrite these sentences. And if it is in passive voice, chances are they want you to recognize that and change it to active voice. So the teacher is screaming, All right? Again, not very strong. The teacher screams is much more effective. The students are sleeping. The student sleep works better. And again, the paper was written by me. Why not say I wrote the paper? Again, much stronger if you phrase it that way. So on the packet, one of the things that it's going to ask you to do is to look at sentences and discover if they are active or passive. Again, an active sentence is going to use an action verb in it. Passive uses linking verbs, so is or was, or again, a sentence like this one, the paper was written by me. It's much stronger if you can rewrite that to I wrote the paper, or the students sleep and give an action verb in there. So again, passive is considered incorrect. So if they ask you on the SAT or ACT to fix it, that's one of the things that they want you to be able to do is to recognize the different verb types and to know which one is preferable. Adjectives describe nouns. What they do is to provide imagery. The other thing to know about adjectives and adverbs and articles is that in a sentence, when we start looking at the sentence patterns, they're all a form of sentence bling. You guys know what bling is. It's that extra superfluous, kind of unnecessary, glamorous, glitzy jewelry or other kinds of things that celebrities and people have. So when we talk about adjectives, they're descriptors. They're not really part of the basic structure of a sentence, and so we can ignore them for the most part. But we still have to know what they are and be able to identify them before we don't have to really pay much more attention to them. So adjectives describe nouns and they provide imagery. So again, they describe nouns. So again, if I said the sweet soda, sweet is describing the soda. The salty pretzel, salty is describing the pretzel. The red car, red describes the car. The stinky socks, stinky is describing the socks. So one of the reasons that we need to know adjectives is because if you have adjectives in a series, you need commas setting them off. So again, here's an example. Please take that smelly, wet, flea-ridden dog away from me. You need commas after smelly and wet, right? Because both smelly and wet describe the dog. Flea-ridden also describes the dog, but again, you need those two commas after smelly and after wet so that you can set these series apart. You also, again, need them if there's only two adjectives. So I have a shiny, comma, expensive diamond ring. My older, comma, more outgoing brother is coming over today. Older and more outgoing both describe my brother. Right? So why do we need to know adjectives besides commas, which they're going to ask you an awful lot about on the SOL exam? Right? 
You also need to know that when you're using the adjectives to compare, right, among my friends, I am the smarter one. Well, if you have a group to whom you're comparing yourself, you're not the smarter, that's comparing yourself to only one person. So here, you need to change that adjective to end in EST. So not I am the smarter one, but I am the smartest of all of my friends. So again, adjectives are important for a couple of reasons. Commas, and again, to know when to use ER, and that's if you're comparing yourself to one person, right? This is better or I am smarter. If you're comparing it to multiple, you use EST. So I am the smartest, right? So when we look at adjectives, it's important to be able to identify them so that you can pick out those kind of common errors. Like adjectives, adverbs are kind of sentence bling. They describe verbs though. They tell how something was done, when, where or to what extent. Oftentimes in elementary school, when they introduce people to adverbs, they'll tell people that adverbs always end in ly. And that's not true, but a lot of them do. To figure out if you're working with an adverb, I always ask the question, verb how, right? So again, whatever that verb is, insert it and then ask the question how. So again, here's an example. He quickly ran, right? Ran how? quickly. He slowly yawned. Yawned how? Slowly. I run oddly. Run how? Oddly. So again, we are almost home is an adverb as well. We are where? Almost, right? The test was too easy. How easy was it? Too easy. So when we work with adverbs, even though they're not going to matter in the basic sentence patterns that we're looking at, you still need to know them for a few reasons, right? SAT and SOL questions abound about adverbs. Often they want you to know that you have to add that L-Y. So here's an example of a question taken directly from an SAT question. Even a person who drives careful cannot operate a motor vehicle when he is under the influence of alcohol. And then again, they expect you to look at that and to know that drives how? Drives carefully, not careful. So again, you'd have to change that since it's a sentence error. So if you want to arrive on time, you better leave quick. Not quick, but quickly. How do we leave? Quickly. So when we look at adverbs, a lot of them end in ly, but not all. If you're trying to identify, again, ask that question verb how, right, or verb when. And that sometimes will help you to identify if it is an adverb. Prepositions are hugely important. Even though they're another part of the sentence bling, you need to know prepositions and prepositional phrases so that you can get rid of them. So a preposition is a directional word, right? In elementary school, they introduce prepositions as anything that a plane can do to a cloud. So again, it can go in the cloud, on, around, by, between, across, through. Uh, there's many different prepositions. So prepositions are those directional words. Prepositions always have a phrase that comes along with them. So again, if you take a look at this one, take me to your leader. To your leader is the prepositional phrase. To is the preposition and your leader is the rest of that phrase. Leader is an object. So prepositions always have an object that comes after them. Again, to go back to our subjects and objects, this is why when you write a letter, you write to whom it may concern. To is a preposition. So you need an object pronoun to whom it may concern. So again, in this sentence, to your leader is the preposition phrase. So again, to object leader, right? Here's another example. We threw the ball around the playground. Around is your preposition. Playground is your object. Prepositions matter in grammar for a couple of reasons. As I said, prepositions always take an object. 
And this is one of the reasons why there's a rule that writers cannot end sentences with prepositions. So sometimes you have to rewrite or reorganize the sentence. You cannot end sentences with prepositions. It generally indicates that you've made some kind of a sentence error. There was a Boost Mobile commercial for a while that ended with, where are you at? And again, I broke more remotes throwing it at the television because again, that's not an appropriate way to use the English language, right? So if you have something like, he gets his point across, you have some options, right? You can say he gets across his point because then the preposition across has an object. He gets across what? His point. Or you can rewrite that sentence. He conveys his message. That sounds a little bit more sophisticated anyway. If you are going someplace like a hotel um, and your parents are in a separate room and you say, what room are you in? Can't do that. Technically, it should be in what room are you? And we don't speak this way, but it's imperative to know that there's a difference between when we speak and when we write. When we write, we have to do so formally. So this is when it must be done by. We don't need that by there at the end. This is when it must be done, right? Or this is by when it must be done. You absolutely should not end sentences with prepositions. So again, Detroit is the city that he was born in. Detroit is the city in which he was born. Or you can simply say he was born in Detroit. That works as well. If you have a preposition, one of those directional words at the end of your sentence, you need to revise that particular sentence. There is another reason that prepositions matter as well. So that's why you have to be able to identify those words like to, by, in, around, among, through. All of those are prepositions. They're directional words. Here's the second reason that prepositions matter. As I mentioned, prepositional phrases are the preposition and its object. So it always takes an object pronoun. Do not listen to your ear when you do these. We speak incorrectly all the time. So again, if you're trying to talk a suspect down and you say, give that gun to the police and almost everybody will say I, right? That is not correct. Two is a preposition, right? You give that gun to me. Me is an object pronoun. And again, if I have a preposition, I need an object. When we look at things like to or whom, get, uh, Jean is the person, to, and again, when we add that preposition, we have to use whom. Jean is the person to whom those flowers were sent. This is why you can't have a preposition at the back end of the sentence. You'll make two errors, right? Jean is the person who those flowers were sent to. First, you have a preposition at the back end of the sentence, which is an error, and you didn't use whom. So again, you've made two grammatical errors in one sentence if you do that. Are you going with Steve and him to the picnic? How did I know? With is a preposition. I need an object pronoun. Going back to my chart, him is the object pronoun. So prepositions matter so that you can get these particular pieces correct. Don't trust your ear because it's not always correct. Look at the structure in the sentence. What is it doing? If you need an object pronoun, use an object pronoun, right? Don't undermine what you're doing because in your eye you've always been told it's blank and I. That is not always the case, right? It's between you and me, not I. Between is a preposition. So between you and me, I need an object pronoun. So again, the things that we say are not always grammatically correct. So when we start talking about sentence patterns, prepositional phrases are a form of that sentence bling, right? Again, they're not necessarily part of the structure. They're providing more information. 
there is a little song that was oftentimes sung at various kinds of camps and things about a hole in the bottom of the sea and a bump on a log. You can continue adding prepositional phrases to a sentence forever. So I went to the mailbox in my underwear on Tuesday in the rain after a storm in the sky. And again, you can keep going with those prepositional phrases. The basic sentence pattern is still just I went. You keep adding these prepositional phrases to it. So when we get to our sentence patterns, it's important that you know prepositions and prepositional phrases because I'm going to ask you to cross them out because they're not important. But again, when we're writing sentences, they're important because we have to know that every preposition is going to have an object. Every prep needs that object that follows after it. The final reason that it's important to know about prepositions is that the SAT and the ACT both love to ask questions about prepositions. One of the hardest things to know about English is it's full of idioms. Idioms are anything that cannot be taken literally if you were to translate it from another uh, language. So something like raise the roof is an idiom. It's raining cats and dogs is an idiom. Um, that party was off the hook is an idiom. Again, somebody who was translating it from another language wouldn't necessarily know what those phrases meant. Likewise, English is very hard to learn because in English, certain verbs only use particular prepositions. They just do. It's the way that it goes. And so the SAT asks questions about this knowledge and it's at the disadvantage of a lot of people who speak English as a second language. But it's important to know your prepositions because oftentimes they'll ask these questions looking at prepositions, making sure that you know idiomatically how these phrases are used. So let me show you a couple of different examples and these are taken directly from SAT and ACT questions. I am preoccupied about my studies. Again, when we use the verb preoccupied, we are preoccupied not about, but preoccupied with. John's awareness about global warming, it's not your awareness about, but your awareness of. She had a fondness towards dolls when she was little. You don't have a fondness towards something, you have a fondness for something. The ACT consists in four sections. Again, consists always uses the preposition not in, but of. So the ACT consists of four sections. So knowing prepositions is really going to help you score better on the SAT, ACT, and SOL exams because you're going to not make some of those careless errors that people generally do when they are not paying close attention. Conjunctions are the other huge problem that people have with sentences. We don't know what to do with punctuation anymore. So many facets of our lives are filled with situations where we don't know what to do with punctuation. So some people either over punctuate, where you sprinkle commas everywhere like fairy dust, or you just don't put it in at all. And again, no matter which way you go, you're going to end up getting questions wrong if you don't practice. So let me talk to you about some of the more important reasons why conjunctions matter, right? Conjunctions, whenever I say the word, people remember that there's an old show called Schoolhouse Rocks and they sang the song about conjunction, junction, what's your function? And that's all people know, right? So again, what they were asking about is what do conjunctions do? And if you ask people about that today, they'll look at you and go, well, duh, oh no. So let's talk about what conjunctions actually do, right? Conjunctions join words or groups of words, right? And is probably the most used conjunction, right? Conjunctions join a bunch of different things. Let's start with the easiest. One of the things that conjunctions can do is to create compounds. And when they're creating compounds, there's no comma needed, like a compound subject or a compound kind of object. So my favorite food is peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly is one thing, right? It's one sandwich. So again, I don't need commas separating it here. Sometimes girls dye their hair different colors or have highlights. So her hair is blonde and brown. 
I don't need any commas there because again, I'm creating that compound. You can also have a compound subject like John and Kim won the game. So again, in that case, and is a conjunction joining John and Kim. Both of them, right, John and Kim won the game. And again, you have to look at this because sometimes they'll tell you put a comma any place that you have a conjunction. And that doesn't always work if you have a compound. So again, you have to look at what it's doing in the sentence. What is it joining? In this case, if it's making a compound subject like John and Kim, you don't need commas there. One of the other things that conjunctions can do is to put sentence pieces together, right? The rapper Ludacris has a song in which he talks about how he doesn't go anywhere unless he and the rest of his group coordinate. Coordinate means to go together. So again, if you coordinate your fashion, it means that it goes together. Well, conjunctions can also connect parts of sentences to make them go together. The most common fanboys, right, and those are coordinating conjunctions, and it's an acronym. It stands for something. So again, fanboys is a little acronym that stands for for, and, nor, but, or, yet, and so. When you have conjunctions that are joining sentence pieces, you're going to need a comma. So here's an example. I went to the game, but I did not play. This but is joining the sentence, I went to the game and I did not play. You need that comma because but is the tie that puts them together. And you do need to know about these fanboys, right? If they are attaching two complete sentences, you must have a comma. I went to the game, comma, and I saw my friend. I went to the game, I saw my friend are being connected by that comma and the and. It's that glue that puts those sentences together or coordinates them. One of the questions that they're gonna ask you about on the SAT, ACT, and SOL is the use of different kinds of punctuation. So you don't create comma splices. Simply put, a comma splice is a comma chilling out where it's not allowed to go, like between two complete sentences. A comma is not sufficient anchor to put together two sentences. So if you have two complete sentences, there's a couple of different ways that you can anchor them together properly so that it works. The first method is by having a period in between them. And we do this all the time to create little simple sentences. I went to the game, period. I did not play. Two very simple sentences, but with the period in between it, it's not incorrect. Now, if you put a comma there, it would be incorrect. Those are called comma splices. Commas where you've got commas where they're not allowed to go, like two, between two complete sentences. One of the other things that you can use is a semicolon between two complete sentences. Now, oftentimes we only use semicolons to make winky faces and text messages, but again, semicolons do more than that. They connect two sentences that are logically connected, right? So you wouldn't say something like, I uh, moved the refrigerator, semicolon, I lost my cat, unless somehow in moving the refrigerator you squished the cat or did something like that. So again, you use semicolons to suggest that there's some kind of connection. So if I said, I threw up, semicolon, I hate Mexican food, you can infer that somehow I'm throwing up because I ate bad Mexican food. So again, the semicolon puts together two complete sentences. So I went to the game, semicolon, I did not play. I was there, but I didn't get put in the game, right? Or you can have a comma and a fanboy. I went to the game, comma, but I did not play. A comma by itself is not enough of an anchor. It's not enough cement to put those two pieces together. You have to have the fanboy in there. So if you join them incorrectly, like just a comma, that's a comma splice. And you have to watch out for those because on the SOL, when you drag and drop punctuation in, if you put punctuation in the wrong place, the whole sentence is wrong. So again, when you have two complete sentences, you can use a period, 
a semicolon, or a comma, and a fanboy. One of the other things that conjunctions do is they put parts of sentences together. The word subordinate, right, means underneath. A subordinate or a dependent clause cannot stand alone as a sentence, right? So take a look at if the train derails. This can't stand alone as a sentence, right? That word if means that it can't stand alone, right? But here on the back end, you have you will die, right? That can stand alone as a sentence. So you have a sentence part that can't be standing alone with a sentence piece that can. If you have that, where you have this one that comes first, you need to put a comma to connect it to the back end. So if the dependent clause comes first, the part that can't stand alone, then you need to put a comma. So if the train derails, comma, you will die. Now, if you can pick it up and move it to the back end of the sentence, you'll no longer need that comma. Think of the comma at the front side as a coat hanger, just like you can move a coat hanger to the back part of the closet. If you can move it to the back part of the closet, it's going to need a comma if it's out there in the front. And that indicates that you can pick it up and put it in the back end of the sentence. Here are some examples, right? Because I was late, I had to eat lunch in 10 minutes. That front part, because I was late, could we move it to the back end of the sentence? I had to eat lunch in 10 minutes because I was late. Yes, I can. So if it's at the front, I need a comma. If it's at the back end, no comma is needed. You can just attach it to the bump. After hearing about the merger, he quit. Can I put it at the back end of the sentence? He quit after hearing about the merger. If I can pick it up and move it to the back end of the sentence, right, then it's not going to need a comma. Think about when you see people dancing at ring dance or prom, right? If it's on the back side, it doesn't need any connector, right? The front side has to connect with the back. So the front side, if it's there, it needs a comma. If it's in the back end, it doesn't need any glue or any comma to go with it. So once again, if you can pick it up and move it to the back end of the sentence, right, you're going to need a comma. After 10 minutes, the doctor called him into the office. I can pick it up, I can move it to the back end, it needs a comma. Because I can, I will end class early. I can pick because I can up and put it in the back end of the sentence. Now it's already at the back, I will end class early because I can, I don't need any of that glue for it if it's at the back already. If it's at the front though, it needs that glue to attach it. And the glue is the comma. So here are some examples of what you can expect to see on the SOL. After the test, the students were dismissed back to class. And it's going to ask you whether or not you need a comma there. The quick test is to pick it up and see if you can move it to the back. After the test, the students were dismissed back to class. The students were dismissed back to class after the test. I need a comma there. I need that glue to hold it to the front. If you have in a series, Hannah, Jean, Michael and John completed the extra credit. I'm going to need commas after Hannah, Jean, and Michael, right? Those are three different things. That's a compound. One of the other forms of punctuation is the colon, the two dots. Colons act as the verbal equivalent in a sentence of, ta-da, you set something special off. So Hannah, Jean, Michael, and John completed the extra credit. Colon, the two dots, biographies of famous people. So if I said, there's only one thing you need to know to pass English 11, colon, bribe your teacher. You need those colons, those two dots, to set off the dun-dun. So think of it that way. Each one of those little dots in the colon is the dun-dun to set it off, right? So they completed the extra credit, colon, biographies of famous people. Lisa and Lauren are on the tennis team. Again, I've got a compound subject. No comma is needed. They also play field hockey. That's a complete sentence. If I've got complete sentence and complete sentence, I need a semicolon. So the sentence should read Lisa and Lauren, no commas in there, are, the t are on the tennis team, semicolon. They also play field hockey. 
The last part of speech that we don't use very often and frankly isn't all that important, the last part of speech is an interjection. An interjection is a word that, again, shouldn't be a complete sentence, but sometimes it is. It's usually some kind of exclamation of emotion. I like to think of them as Little John words. If you remember the rapper Little John, he was always exclaiming random little things like, yeah, and that's right. And again, all of those little things aren't really sentences, but they are explanations of emotions. And so usually interjections are those random Little John words that are set off by a comma or exclamation point. So like, hey, or oh, or ouch, or yeah, or well, all of those are interjections, right? They interrupt a sentence, and they really can't stand alone as a sentence, but sometimes they do. And so interjections are very rare that you're gonna see any questions about them, but it's good to know that those are out there. And again, if you just think of them like your little John words, those random exclamations of emotion, you'll never get them wrong. Words like, wow, or even today when you send like LOL, right? That's an example of an inter interjection. Now that you know the basic parts of speech, it's time to move on to the sentence patterns. There are only five basic sentence patterns in the English language. So if you know them, you will make sure that you never make a grammatical error. And on something like the SOL, where every sentence matters, and if you make too many errors, you're not going to pass, these guides can be invaluable. So the sentence patterns are the bare bones of the sentences once you get rid of all the bling. So when we talked about it, the bling included things like prepositional phrases, adjectives, and adverbs. They didn't really do anything but add to the sentence, add description. So we're gonna go through the basic sentence patterns so that you have a knowledge of them. And the reason that we're going to do this is that we've all had the point that we've looked at a sentence and gone, something is not right with this sentence, but you can't quite figure out what it is. Sometimes you choose to leave it. Sometimes you'll ask a friend, hey, what's wrong with this sentence? And they usually look at you and go, mm -hmm. you don't want to leave a sentence like that on the SOL or even on the SAT for that matter. So again, when in doubt, choose short and simple. Now you don't wanna write your entirety of your essay in short and simple sentences, but if the choice is make an error or get it right, always err on the side of caution and get it right. The first type of sentence pattern is simple subject verb. So in a subject verb sentence, you are going to ignore any kind of prepositional phrases. All of the articles, which are basically adjectives, all of the adverbs, none of those matter. You're looking for the subject and the verb. So if you take a look at the first one, the big dog ran to its master. The first thing to do is to get rid of the sentence bling. We've got a prepositional phrase here, right? The prep phrase is to its master. So again, we can just cross that out. So we have this sentence, the big dog ran. Well, the and big just describe dog. So again, that's my subject. What did the dog do? Ran. So dog ran is the basic sentence pattern. As my check, if it's got a subject and a verb here, it's complete, so it's a sentence. So again, I can check to make sure that my sentences are not fragments and that nothing is grammatically incorrect. So dog ran is the basic sentence pattern. Commands can be sometimes tricky too. You have a you understood subject. So if I yell at somebody, it's understood that I'm yelling at them. So if I say sit, the subject is you understood and the verb, what do I want you to do? Sit, so you sit is subject verb. I am is subject verb. I subject am verb. I sat in the office. Again, prepositional phrases don't count. So in the office is gone. I subject, sat, verb. It is that easy. It is just that simple. But to get to this point, you have to be able to identify the subject and identify the verb and to get rid of any of those things that are just extra superfluous sentence bling, like to its master. So we have to know all the basic parts of speech to get to this point. 
But again, that's subject verb. And I can add lots of prepositional phrases and we get rid of all of them. So the big dog ran to its master in the rain on Tuesday. I'm going to get rid of all of those pieces. The only thing that matters is the subject and the verb. Get rid of the sentence blank. The most common that you're going to see is subject, verb, object. So again, the first thing that we have to do for all of these sentences is to identify the who's doing it. That's the subject. So I've got Tim threw the ball down the street to Bobby. Before I begin, get rid of that sentence bling. Where do you see directional words? Down the street and to Bobby are both prep phrases, so I can get rid of them. So I have the subject, who did it? Tim. Tim did what? Through, that's my verb. Through what? Ball. S-V-O. I baked cookies. Who did it? I did. Subject. Did what? Baked. Baked what? Cookies. S-V-O. I ate spaghetti. Who did it? I did. What did I do? Ate. That's my verb. What did I eat? Spaghetti. That's my object. So again, S-V-O. If I had, I bake cookies on Tuesday in the oven, again, I can get rid of all of those prep phrases. I'm looking for the base of the sentence and checking for a subject and a verb. And again, does it have an object? Verbed what or verbed who? In this case, cookies is a what or spaghetti is a what. Or if I said, I punched Jim, I did it. What did I do? I punched. Who did I punch? Jim. S V. Oh, so that's the second sentence pattern. The third sentence pattern is a little more tricky, but again, when we're doing this, we just have to keep in mind that the subject is the person that's doing it. The verb is what you did. Then you have a direct object that's getting the action of the verb and an indirect object that indirectly gets the action of that verb. There's only a few verbs in the English language that take an indirect object. Mailed and sent and through are some of them. So here are some examples. I mailed my brother two letters yesterday, right? So the subject, whoever's doing it, is I. What did I do? I mailed. What did I mail? I mailed two letters. Letters is the direct object. Now who got those letters? My brother did. So my brother is the indirect object. The direct object is what I mailed, which are the letters, right? Take a look at number two. I threw the first baseman the ball. So again, I did it, subject. What did I do? I threw. Threw what? The ball. Who got the ball? The first baseman. So the ball is the direct object. First baseman is the indirect object. And I just want to point out that this is a different sentence than I threw the ball to the first baseman. In that sentence, we get rid of the sentence bling. So we get rid of to the first baseman. So I did it. What did I do? Through. Through what? The ball. Right? To the first baseman doesn't matter. The only thing that matters in that sentence grammatically is that I threw the ball. So when we look at S-V-I-O-D-O -O sentences, you're looking at, again, that there's going to be a verbed what, that's the direct object, and then who or what got that direct object and that's the indirect object in the sentence. The last sentence types deal with linking verbs. Linking verbs are those that are state of beings. Remember, they act as the grammatical equivalent of the equal sign in a sentence. So subject, linking verb, predicate adjective. Remember, the predicate is the verb in the bum end of the sentence. Everything that occurs in that back end after the verb is that predicate. So an adjective, putting the P in front of it, says that it's an adjective that you just can't throw out. It's an important adjective, right? So take this sentence, he is ugly. Usually, we don't pay any attention to adjectives, but in this sentence, you're trying to say he equals ugly, right? U-G-L-Y, he ain't got no alibi, he ugly. Okay, ugly is that adjective that we're trying to say he equals equals. You can't just throw it out. It's an important adjective. So when we put the P, it tells us that it's in the back end of the sentence 
and it's an adjective that's important so we can't throw it away all right so he is ugly is a subject he lv linking verb predicate adjective ugly describes what he is so again because it's a descriptive word it's an adjective so again if the sentence were she is beautiful she subject linking verb is beautiful is that adjective that describes her so that's slvpa and keep in mind those only happen with linking verbs like was or were or are the next type that deals with linking verbs is subject linking verb predicate noun now again the technical term is a predicate nominative i'm going to get to what that means in a second but basically it's a noun but it's a noun in the subject position all right so let's look at the easy one and then we'll get to that and explain what it means so again subject linking verb and a noun in that back end or predicate of the sentence that's really important so sarah subject linking verb is is what she's a teacher so a teacher is a predicate nominative that describes what sarah is so subject linking verb predicate nominative or predicate noun if you prefer right the one thing that i was telling you about though is that a nominative is a subject so this is why when you pick up the phone, your mom or dad has probably told you that you answer the phone, this is she or this is he, and you probably didn't know why. Well, this, right, is your subject, is is your linking verb. Now I need a noun that's in the subject position, right? She, not her, is the subject. So this is why you say this is she, right? Or again, this is we, if you're answering for a bunch of people. It's also the reason why the famous toy store should actually be toys are we, not toys are us, right? Toys are we. So when we look at the sentence patterns, we're looking at the basics, right? If I had Sarah is a teacher of language arts at a high school in Nebraska, of language arts at a high school in Nebraska. All of that can go away because it's just sentence bling. So what sentence patterns do is to look at the basics of a sentence, the bare bones, if you will. This is why we call it diagramming. We're looking at the function. What is it doing? The form is if we looked at every word and said what it is. Sarah is a noun, is is a verb, a is an article, teacher is a noun. But what I really care about is what it's doing, the function. Sarah is the subject, is is the linking verb, teacher is that predicate nominative or predicate noun. So sentence patterns break it down to the bare bones of the sentences.